Good evening, church. It's good to be back at First Baptist Church. Last week I was in uh, the state of Oregon, and uh, a young pastor there that I've known him, known his father for a long, long time, and he said, uh, Brother Sam, as you go around the country, he said, uh, tell me some of the favorite churches where you preach. And uh, so he mentioned some on the West Coast where he knew I'd been, and I talked about some of that. And then he said, well, what about oh, in what they call the Midwest, which is still a mystery to me, but still anyway, this is the Midwest. And they said, what about the Midwest? And I said, well, there are several churches that I've been at many, many times and love to go there. But I said, there's a couple that are probably my favorites in the Midwest, and that would be Cleveland Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. So I was just talking about you last week. And uh, so that means the reason I'm buttering you up is I want to name men or two along the way so we can <laughs> keep this thing moving here and, and keep it going. And one of the things I like about it, obviously, most of the time I've been here, I've been doing the preaching, except for sometimes at the church triumphant conference, I've got to hear preaching. Uh, I've always thought it'd be a neat thing to come uh, under Pastor Willette when he was preaching here, just pop in on a Sunday, but you just don't go driving through this part of the country by the way, you know what I mean? And so that never happened. But uh, one of the things I like is you know you're going to get good music. You know it. Uh, I got to go to our home church, Southwest, last uh, Sunday night. And uh, the music, we don't have our choir in place yet like you usually do. And don't have our choir in place yet. But the two specials that were sung before the pastor preached, yeah, I said, told my wife, this is right. This is good. Just good, good, meaningful songs, uplifting, helpful. Thank you all for the uh, singing tonight. I've always liked it ever since I started coming here to hear Brother Dalton sing. Uh, I like manly singing. And his voice and just the way he sings it and belts it out. Yeah, this breathy stuff, oh, mercy, I don't know. I just can't handle that. No, I like this kind of singing. I do. Thank you, Brother Dalton. Thank you, Trio, including his wife. And then the other trio, Brother Dylan, thank you. Just some really, really good music. I love it. John 2 is where we are. While you're turning to the Gospel of John in chapter 2, I noticed that we have some uh, CDs and some Heartland music back on the table. And uh, I'll be happy to be back there uh, in a few, you know, after a while. And if you're interested in purchasing them, there are some new CDs that just came out, also got messed up by the pandemic. Uh, but there are some new, uh, two new CDs, I think, back there that I haven't even got to hear yet. So I am looking forward to hearing them. But if you're interested in that, come by and we'd be happy to have, it, uh, to have you uh, look at them. All right, we're in the Gospel of John chapter 2, verse 1. Let's stand together, if you would, for the reading of the word. <clears throat> And we're going to read the first 11 verses. The first 11 verses. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. I, I don't have time to go into all the background. Very early in Jesus' uh, public ministry, just prior to this, was baptized of John, tempted of the devil uh, in the wilderness, and came back and started choosing his disciples. And that's at the end of chapter 1. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, a head scratcher for some people, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And there's a whole sermon I'd like to preach on that, but we've got to keep reading. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler, governor of the feast, had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, oh, I love this parenthesis, but the servants which drew the water knew, into parenthesis, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, 
and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let's thank the Lord for his word and ask him to help us one more time. Lord, I know that many have prayed before they came to the service. Pastor and I had prayer in the office. Some have prayed in this uh, service tonight. We're, we're thankful for that. But one more time before we get into your word, O oh God, we acknowledge our need of thee, our need of the help of the Holy Spirit for anything to be accomplished here tonight. So I pray that you would help me. I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and mind and give your people ears to hear. Lord, I pray that there would be a good attentiveness. I am so thankful that we are assembling together uh, here at First Baptist Church tonight, that the congregation has come together for this service. And I, I pray that during this time, maybe our appetite, our desire to be with the household of God uh, of which you've made us a part in our particular congregations and to sit under live preaching in person. Oh God, I pray that maybe our appetite has been heightened by that son. And whatever the case, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and make this a profitable time both in the life of every individual that's present and in the life of this your church. Thank you again for your goodness and for your precious word in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you. you may be seated. <clears throat> On May the 15th, I <clears throat> got a phone call uh, from a young man that was a youth pastor in West Virginia. And uh, I think he and I had met, but I've never been to that church. And I've been to several places in West Virginia, but not there. And I don't know a whole lot of pastors and churches there. But he said, uh, we're getting ready to have a youth rally. And uh, it was scheduled, of course, to be at our church. And it's a big event. But because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, shutdown, he said uh, the yet rally has been canceled in terms of people coming here having the big gathering that we normally have. So we're having it online. And all the youth pastors that would normally be involved are encouraging and promoting their young people to tune in to either Facebook or whatever the media might be where they were gonna have the service and for everybody to tune in and to benefit. They had a theme, they had their guest speaker all lined up. And he said, I'm calling several pastors and preachers around the country and I'm asking them to promote uh, this meeting and to give a word of wisdom to all the young people with this meeting coming up. So he said, I just want you to give us a word of wisdom for the teenagers. <clears throat> and my wife was sitting right there and I had it on speakerphone. She's kind of pointing at it like you, words of wisdom. You know, you know how wives are, real encouraging that way. And so anyway, I'm telling her to be quiet so I can concentrate on this and so uh, nonetheless, I go on and find out that he wants me to give these words of wisdom in 10 seconds. He wants it done in 10 seconds. And I'm not generally known as a short preacher or anything. It would be far easier to preach for 30 minutes than it would be to think of something meaningful for 10 seconds, unless you really give it thought, which I had a few days. And then on the last day uh, of the deadline, then I sat down in our living room and I had my wife be the, you know, run the telephone, uh, the, uh, my cell phone and to take the video so we could send it on to them for their promotion. And here's what I came up with. I came up with these words. Jesus said he came to give life abundantly. You have one life. Give your life to Jesus. Now, you may not think that's possible. 10 seconds right there, just, I mean, exactly 10 seconds. And uh, it's, I feel sort of now like I did at home. I was a lot more impressed with that myself than my wife was. But anyway, I got it done in 10 seconds. 
And I want to repeat that line because this is, these are words of wisdom on the authority of the Word of God. Not because I said them, but because of the authority of the Word of God. Jesus said he came to give life abundantly. And you have one life. Give your life to Jesus. Now, in about six weeks, I'll be 75 years of age. I still need to practice what I am challenging the young people to do, and that is give the days that I have to the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, that is good advice for anyone, anywhere. Because, you know, he did come to give us life. I'm very thankful that because of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to hell. The sermons, two sermons in a row on Sunday morning that I heard before I got saved were, were about hell. And secondly, what Jesus did so a boy like me wouldn't go to hell. And I believed in a literal hell, as I still believe in a literal hell. And I believe that sinners that die without Jesus Christ go to that awful place. And I'm thankful that salvation had to do with saving me from such condemnation and from such penalty for sin. I'm very thankful for that. But I'm also thankful, having lived a few years, for the kind of life that he desires to give us while we are here. And he said, I've not only come that you might have life, but that you might have it what? More abundantly. And I'm very, very thankful for that. And no one is going to experience abundant living that is rebellious to the authority of Jesus Christ. I mean, let's remember, he is called the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some people that are scared to death to talk about the fact or the matter of his lordship. We talk about Jesus, the uh, Savior. We talk about Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. But he is also Lord. And that means he has authority. If you study the book of John, you're going to see that a lot of the book of John has to do with the authority that Jesus had as the, or has, as the Son of God. See? And so that's just a, that's a part of who he is. And we don't, listen to this, we don't live a life that makes us acceptable to him uh, by obeying or by submitting. We come to God by faith in Jesus Christ, and we are saved by grace through faith. Anything else is heresy. But once we know Jesus Christ, then it is clear that he intends, let's put it this way, to run our life. Now, there are some people, as soon as they hear, I don't want anybody running my life, I'm going to run my own life, and they just seem to have this spirit and this attitude. Well, I'm so happy to tell you. I started to say I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not. I'm happy to tell you that when you trusted Jesus to be your Savior, I'm telling you, He fully intends to take charge of your life. That's who He is. He's Lord. You don't separate Him. Well, he's Lord, he's Jesus, he's Christ, but I'll take the Jesus Christ part. No, I'm sorry. That he is Lord. That's who he is. Now, in this account, we have a, an, an incredible story of the first miracle of Jesus that uh, the ceremony was about to take place, the final ceremony, they had no wine. Now, I don't have time to go into all the ramifications there that it would be a terrible insult if you had guests that came to such an occasion and did not serve them wine in, in their custom in their day. If you study the times and the customs that they had, it would be a terrible insult. And they started out, which this may have been a three or four day event, you got to understand, and they start, started out with wine and now they're coming to this critical part of the celebration and of the occasion, they have no wine. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now, I'm, I kind of suspect he was already aware of what was going on. How about you? <laughs> so she comes, though, and says, they have no wine. And then Jesus answers what he answers to the mother. If I start talking about it, we'll never get out of here. So I'm going to keep going. And, and he answers what he answers to his mother. And then she wisely says, whatever he says, do that. That's always good advice. I said, that continues to be good advice. Whatever he says, just go do that. See, no need making this thing complicated. And so she told the servants and said, hey, you just go do what he says. 
And so the next thing you know, we have the water that is turned into wine, and it's an amazing account. It's the introduction of Jesus' miracles of how many more to come. How, how many miracles, how many mighty works did he, did he do? Well, read the end of uh, the Gospel of John, and John says many other things that he did that I suppose if we wrote them all down, the world itself could not contain the books. You remember that? And so we know that he did many, many works, many, many mighty works, and those miracles just continued on. But this first miracle sort of sets the tone for us and gives us an understanding of what happens or what we might expect when Jesus is in charge or when Jesus takes over or when his lordship is made evident and what happens here can be applied to your individual life and my individual life. And one of the things we might do here is kind of use this account as a measure or as a way to determine, am I really living under his lordship? Am I really living under his authority? Can I really say that Jesus is in charge of my life? Can I really say that he has taken over my life? Because I'm going to show you right here that the things that we're going to observe and pay attention to in this first account or this account of his first miracle are things that will become manifest everywhere Jesus takes over and in whose ever life he controls. So let's look at this for just a moment. Verse number three. I want you to think about this again. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, unto him, they have no wine. Now let's stop here for just a moment. I was thinking about it this way here just a while back. Uh, I've had the wonderful privilege from the time I got out of Bible college, started out in the ministry, to try to be a preacher for 53 years. And uh, that's a pretty large window. You know, if we are given three score and ten, and if we're given a life of 70 years, well, I'll pass that by four and almost five. And, and so I look at that and I think, you know, that's a large part of my life. That's a pretty good window in which to work. And we understand that when Jesus began his public ministry, he was about 30 years of age. And when Jesus began uh, to be made known as the Son of God and he began his public ministry, he had what? Three to three and a half years. Now, that's a very small window. Here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and let's not forget, he came for the ultimate purpose, pay the price for sin, so you and I could be saved. That's why when he's singing a while ago, I, I tried not to look at anybody specifically, but it always wonders a wonder to me how people can straight, stay straight-faced when somebody is singing well some of the great truths of our redemption, our salvation, and who we are in Jesus Christ. I don't know why we're not up jumping over pews and running around this room. Well, I can see that's not going to happen, so I'll just go on. But, but I'm just saying, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, this this wonder and Jesus came for that ultimate purpose to pay for our sin I think you and I would agree that his is the most significant life to ever walk upon this earth and he accomplished the most significant purpose of anybody that ever set foot upon this earth and that he was headed every footstep and every heartbeat was leading him to the cross of Calvary where he would die instead of you and where he would pay for your sin instead of you paying for your sin. And when he would be our substitute, let's go on farther, when he would pay the price that would reconcile us to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And he had about three and a half years. And his mother comes and says they have no wine. Now I'm just saying from the human side, I almost made me, if I was there, want to say, please, I mean, do you understand why he's here? Well, she did, or she at least had been told why he was here. I mean, after it is announced that that which is conceived is her, in hers of the Holy Ghost, she utters that song, that Magnificat, where she talks about God, her Savior. So she was made aware of that. And, and my point is this, with someone so significant coming to do something so significant with such a short window of time. Are you serious? He's got time to tend to a little issue like turning water into wine so that it won't blow this wedding <laughs> of common people, probably poor people. And, and 
and you want him to give attention to it? Now, don't act like I'm weird for thinking that because I see it elsewhere. You know, there were times that uh, Jesus' disciples said to him, let us send her away. The point I'm trying to make is when Jesus takes over, he gives attention to simple human need. You will not find a time where Jesus said to anyone, individual, where he said to them, go on now, I don't have time for you. That's not implied. It's not suggested. It's certainly not stated. It never happened. That when Jesus Christ came, he gave attention to simple human needs like wine at this marriage in Cana, a little village in Galilee. Think about that. And Jesus gave attention to it like it might be the most important thing going on. Well, if he's involved in it, I think it's safe to say it was the most important thing going on. And so Jesus took the time to do that. Now, follow his life, follow his ministry. It doesn't matter. He had time to give attention to individuals and the needs of those individuals. Come on. When the miracles started, people started bringing the miracles. They came from Galilee. They came from Judea. They came from beyond Jordan. They came from everywhere the Jews were. And do you read anywhere where Jesus refused to deal with someone's need? No. Or there is the widow of Nain or Zacchaeus up in the tree? Or whether it's the woman with the issue of blood that touched the hem of his garment? Or whether it's Matthew at the receipt of custom talked to him individually and said, follow me? And it just goes on and on. That when Jesus... Now, stop and think about that. Why is it that the Son of God who comes here for this most significant of reasons to do the most significant act that only he could do, and that is pay for the sins of the world, why would he do this? Why would he have time for this? Uh, why would he take the time in such a short window with which to do his work? Why would he do that? I'll tell you why. He was a man. Jesus was a man. The scripture says it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a faithful and merciful high priest. Think about that for a minute. That it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren. That though he was equal, uh, though, though he came made manifest as a man, he was equal with God. Philippians chapter 2. We understand that. So here he is, God, man. How deep is that? Well, it's deeper than any of us can go tonight. Well, don't you believe that he was every bit God, every bit man? Absolutely. I have to. That's what is revealed in the Word of God. Would you explain that more fully? <laughs> sort of. I'll go as far as the Word of God says. But do you think my mind or your human feeble mind, our feeble minds, do you think we're really going to wrap our round, uh, minds around this thing fully, that this is God and man? No, come on. We're talking about God as he reveals himself in his word. And that he expressed himself in the purpose of his son, Hebrews chapter 1, the express image of his person. And here he is, both God and man. And while he was here, he never surrendered his deity. The song that we probably all love, and can it be? It, it, it has a line in there that said, he emptied himself of all but love. Well, that sounds good. A lot of people sing it. A lot of people say amen. But he did not empty himself of his deity. Though there was big theological debate about that when Charles Wesley wrote the song. I'm going to tell you right now, Mr. Wesley had it wrong if he thought Jesus emptied himself of his deity just to manifest his love. He never emptied himself of his deity. He was God and he was man. There's one God, one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, so says the word of God. And while he came, he was every bit man. And the apostle Paul also wrote in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, where I quoted from him just a little bit ago, saying then that we have a, a great high priest that can not be, so we have, or he put it this way, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of our need. Tempted in all points like as we are. There are some that feel like their situation is just so unique and their life is just so different than everybody, than everyone else's. And then they will begin to express themselves and they'll say something like this and they'll identify what they need. Yeah, but my situation is this. Well, you don't have a situation he knows nothing about. You don't have a situation. Oh, yes, my situation is I was betrayed by friends. I was betrayed by friends and family. Some people are laughing, not because you get betrayed, but because you'd think you're alone. Have you read on a third grade level of Jesus? You know what betrayal is? He knows what betrayal is. You know what it is to be forsaken? He knows at another level what it means to be forsaken. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You don't have an emotion. You don't have a feeling. You don't have a temptation. No, that it behooved him to in all things be made like unto his brethren, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And some are maybe even sitting there right now. I can think of some situations that I'm quite sure he never did. I'm going to what the Bible says, not what you try to conjure up in your mind to prove that your situation is so different than everybody else's. It's really not. And whatever the need is, the answer is not modern psychology. And whatever the need is, the answer is not more of this world's goods to make you feel better about yourself. And uh, whatever the need is, it is not higher self-esteem. The real need that you have in every situation and need of your life is Jesus. Amen. Does he care? Does he care? My life is certainly, the crisis in my life is certainly something worse than a marriage where there's not enough grape juice. My situation is a lot worse than that. I wonder if he knew that. Of course he does. Of course he does. A good way to measure, is Jesus in control or running my life, is this. Do I take my needs to him to be met? Or do I type it in my computer and to send it out to the whole world to pray for me? I got a feeling that some are thinking, man, are you a negative minded person? I just fear, I just fear there are many people that are missing the joy of knowing communion with Jesus and answered prayer and him meeting your need because you're counting on the prayers of everybody on 200 people's prayer list. Why don't you, before you type anything in, make sure you've spent ample, meaningful time with Jesus casting your care upon him, for he does care for you, and see if he won't do for you what he did for this minimally important cause here at the marriage of Cana. Why don't you see if he'll do that? And I say, I said, maybe a good way to measure whether he is in control of our life is by looking at how are we doing in taking our needs to him for his control rather than manipulating, trying to fix it ourselves. I'm running my own life. I determine my own destiny. There are believers that wouldn't say that, but they live that way. Yeah. That's a good way to see. Am I taking my needs to him? Look at another thing here. Uh, it, it says on that uh, his mother told the servants, now just do what he says. And, you know, there's six water pots there. And we could talk about the size of them and everything. There's a significant amount of, of juice there and water. They would hold a significant amount of water turned into grape juice or wine. And, uh, and, and Jesus saith unto them, look down in verse 7, fill the water pots with water and they filled them to the brim. Now who is them? Well, it's the servants up in verse number 5. That's, the, that's who it is, the servants. And some people might want to talk about their status. Let me just say to you, they were at the wedding, whether they were slave-like uh, people or whether they were not, they were at the wedding for the purpose of serving. 
Now, whether they were household servants like that, I have no idea. Or whether they were called in to serve for this particular situation, I'm not sure. I just know they weren't the highest on the ladder of significance in this wedding. Somebody say amen so I can go on. They are servants. And Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And, and then he tells them to draw it out, and they do, and they go tell the governor of the feast, and the governor goes, the ruler of the feast goes, tells the bridegroom, because this water has been turned into what I'm almost sure is the best wine any of them had ever drunk. I mean, if Jesus made it, count on it, friend, this is good stuff. And they were amazed, they were amazed, because this isn't usually the way it goes. Now, here's the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that when Jesus got ready to do his first miracle, he took these water pots of stone, common vessels, to every household. They had to have them to fulfill the custom of the Jews. And besides that, they didn't go turn on a spigot for their water. You know where they were. And so these water pots of stone played a significant part in everyone's house. And these water pots of stone mean they're nothing special. They're, they're nothing special at all. They're just common vessels, common to everyone everywhere. And then notice who he called upon to assist him in this miracle. He called upon servants. He called upon these men who themselves had no high standing. They weren't from the upper echelon of society. There weren't Jews all around Cana that looked at them and knew their name and their family's name and, and knew them as somebody that was uh, uh, some of the most influential uh, people of society. No, friends. They were servants. And when Jesus got ready to do this miracle, he took the water pots of stone because they were available there. And he took the servants because they were available. And out of that comes this incredible miracle that launches his miracle working ministry. The point where Jesus is in charge, he uses common vessels. Common vessels. Some of you are probably thinking right now, yeah, where is that? First Corinthians 1. Not many mighty. Not many wise by the standards of the world. Not many are called. He didn't say not any. There's some very intellectual people running around that know the Lord, that really know the Lord. In fact, I've never told you this. I'll tell you right now. I've been with Brother Willette in a lot of situations, and I've told my wife, if Brother Willette and I ever really strongly disagree on something, and I know I'm right, I'm still not going to argue with him. <laughs> I'll just raise up the white flag. No, I'm going to lose this argument even though I know I'm right, you know. And, and so, no, it doesn't mean there aren't people out here that have a mind. It doesn't mean that he uses somebody that can't even think. That's, that's not what he's talking about. What he is clearly making it known here is that he uses those who are available. One of the ways we might measure, is Jesus really the Lord of my life? Is he really in control? Could I really give a testimony to somebody? Here's what you need to do. Because since I turned my life over to Jesus, did you hear the words of the song that Brother Dylan sang a while ago? It started out about talking about when he, uh, when he made Jesus Lord of his life. There was a yieldingness there. There's a surrender. That's what the songwriter was talking about anyway. And so you might look at yourself and ask the question, well, I don't know why I don't have the joy. I don't know why I don't have this sense of usefulness. I don't know why this and why that about my Christian life. And I don't know. I think I'm not doing a bunch of junk I used to do. And I go to church on a regular basis. But I just want to ask you a question. Are you available for him to do with your life whatever he will have you do with your life? Or do you have any kind of boundaries set that you'll follow him so far, but no farther? You'll obey him in certain things, but don't touch this part. Huh? It might be a good way to see. Because I'll tell you who Jesus uses. People that are available. There are preachers that have stood and that are standing all across this land Yea, around the world, that nobody would have looked at their life when they were in high school and said, that's something special. Nobody would have looked at them when they got to Bible college 
and said, there's somebody special. In fact, some of them that I recall, both at Heartland and my own Bible college experience, that were pegged as can't miss, missed really bad. And some that nobody paid a whole lot of attention to are being used of God in a wonderful way. You know who he uses? Those who are available. They don't have to have all the contacts that somebody else might have. They don't have to have the bloodline that somebody else has, the Christian heritage, like a guy like me got. I've, my wife and I have talked about her family, my family, and we've concluded that there's no one on earth that has less excuse for giving their God their best than us. If we don't give our God, uh, if we don't give God our best, we have no excuse for it. Raised in the right kind of homes by the right kind of parents, raised under the right kind of preaching, there's no excuse for us not to have given our life to Jesus. But he uses those that are available, not to some that had a Sam Davidson upbringing or somebody else's upbringing that you may have thought desirable. Make yourself available. Amen. In fact, just to make sure we don't miss the point, if you find yourself at church just kind of saying, well, yeah, they do this, they do that, I go, and the work of God goes on, and you don't lift a finger? That's probably pretty good evidence you're not available. Because if you're available, he'll use you. I'm not saying you'll ever stand behind a pulpit. I'm not saying you'll ever sing, may the Lord help us from some of us getting up here and trying to sing like these men have sung tonight. Yeah. No. But if you're just kind of watching it all go by and you're not being used, don't start pointing fingers at the church and don't blame God. You avail yourself to his usefulness. Did you know if you remember this church, he placed you in the body to make a contribution to the whole. That's why you're here. And probably if that's not happening and you don't see yourself being used, it probably has nothing to do with nobody likes you. Everybody thinks you're a loser. Probably has nothing to do with that. Probably has a lot to do with your heart's availability. Because when Jesus takes over, he uses, he uses simple human vessels. Yeah. And finally, look down at verse 8. He saith unto them, Draw out now and bear to the governor of the peace. Well, they filled him to the brim. You saw that in verse 7. Now, now go, go show it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And the ruler of the feast had tasted, and when the ruler of the, uh, read it right, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, watch this, but the servants knew, which drew the water, more about that in just a little bit. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and the governor of the feast said to the bridegroom, you know, you are amazing. And the bridegroom says, it's all there if you just look close enough. The bridegroom says, I am? Yeah. How am I amazing? Well, everybody else begins and sets forth the good wine first. And then, uh, after men have well drunk, then that wine which is worse. In other words, if they're about to run out, they'll add water to it. And it being weakened is not the quality of what they began with. But they can't afford to run out. And he said, and what you've done is just the opposite. You have saved the best wine until now. This is amazing. Now, we know the governor of the feast had nothing to do with it. The bridegroom. They were clueless. Only people that knew what was going on was Jesus and those that did what he said. Ooh, I don't have time to preach this, but there's a lot of preaching right there. Do you know who knows what's going on in the world? Obviously, not everybody that's sitting in official government positions. <laughs> Do you know what's going on in the world? Obviously, not the people that stand in state universities and teach humanism and Marxism and on and on and on and on. Obviously, they don't know what's going on in the world. You know who's going on in the world? 
Those that make themselves available to Jesus Christ and act upon his word and walk with him and do what he says, they have an insight that even the leaders that should know don't know. The governor didn't know and the bridegroom didn't know and both of them should have known something about what's going on here. But it was Jesus, a guest, and it was these servants that were there to serve that had an inside track on what's going on. Yeah. But that's not the main point. It's just something worth throwing a fit about. All right. So look in verse 9. But the ser servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom said, well, look at this. You started out with the best, and usually it gets worse. But this is the best I've ever seen. You've saved the best till now. Can I have your attention up here? That's just like Jesus. Okay, the way of the world. Let's try this. Mm, the, the Bible says, oh, no, it'll be great. It'll be fun. Whether it's drinking, doping, gambling, pornography, immorality, let's do this. Oh, I see. Aren't you glad you're not a member of a narrow-minded, fundamental Baptist church? You'd never get to enjoy all this. And it all seems so delightful and good. In prisons and in institutions for correction and recovery are full of people who started out thinking this will always be good. And it goes down and down and down. As a pastor, I've sat with parents and either son or daughter and said, but this relationship cannot be the will of God. This is not a marriage that God can bless by the authority of his word. I beg you. And then they break the bands and leave the church, marry as they want to, defend their children, and go on. And their first attitude is, see, narrow-minded preacher want to control everybody's life. When all you're trying to do is get them to live by what Jesus taught. Right. And then the struggles, the pain, the disappointment, the lies it happens. It's sad. It's really sad. But where Jesus is in control, this isn't something just to put in a song and try to make everybody think you're happy. This is the way it really works. That where Jesus is in control, it may start out good. And I remember getting saved at six years old. I thought that was pretty good. I was pretty happy about my salvation. How about you? Amen. Well, don't show it on your face. You wouldn't want to show it, but I'm just saying. How about you? Pretty happy. I get, I getting saved is pretty good stuff, isn't it? Amen. Was that the best it ever got? No, not if you let him take control of your life. Sometimes we battle, sometimes we struggle, but he is faithful. And when you let him take control of your life, so help me, you can get to the point where you say, Jesus, you've saved the best till now. This, this is just like what you did in that miracle. You saved the best till right to the end, and you saved the best till now. And they're, they're saying, the governor and the bridegroom, they say, no, it usually works. I don't know what's going on here. Well, Jesus is in control. And when he's in control, it starts here, and then it gets better, and then it gets better. And I tell you, I got saved when I was six, and I surrendered to preach when I was 16. Now, I pulled a little silly Jonah stunt after that, but I always loved preachers. They came to our house and ate meals, and I looked up to preachers like I looked up to my brother's buddies that were in the Korean War and came to our house when I was a little boy in their uniforms, and I looked up to them. That's the way I looked up to preachers. And, and I remember standing in awe of preachers, sitting up close as I could when my behavior was right, and listening to these preachers preach and spit all over the place and sweat and wear their cowboy boots and jump up on the pews and all of that. That kind of thing. But they weren't just up there demonstrating or showing some kind of a, 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 a entertainment thing. They were preaching with fire and fervor the Word of God. I remember thinking, man, this is the way preaching is supposed to be. I loved it. God called me to preach. 
And when I got serious about it, I thought, are you serious? I just thought I wanted to play basketball. I'd have starved to death <laughs> trying to earn a living playing a basketball or baseball for the Cardinals. I'd have starved my family to death trying to earn a living that way. Or farm. Why, I, fi I figured it out. Pastor, I figured it out that if I had stayed with farming, I could easily be at least $5 million in debt. <laughs> Easy. Look what I gave up to follow Jesus. I'm serious. And through time when we got to start out in the ministry, it's not like everything was always rosy, but we were doing what God called us to do. And even in some of the hardest and most difficult times, Sandra and I could look at each other and say, still, it's right. It's right that we're in the ministry. And I remember her saying to me, you can't do anything else. <laughs> well, shame on you for thinking that way. What she meant is I can't be in the will of God and do anything else. <laughs> Was she right about it the other way? Well, yes, but still, the only thing I could do and be in the will of God is do what I've done with my life. That's the only thing I could do. And we still get to do what God called us to do. And I, I remember becoming a pastor, and the church was on life support, and I just saw God work. And, and we saw Him work, and Sandra and I would go home on Sunday night, get the kids to bed, and we'd sit around and talk about the day. And we'd look at each other and say, can you believe this? We get to be a part of this, what the Lord's doing there, and what He's doing in their life. And people are getting called to preach, and some going to the mission field. And we're starting a church here, and we're going to start another church there. Can you believe this? It just got better and better. When the Lord pulled the rug out from under me in 1990 and made me leave my first love in Stillwater, Oklahoma, to go to Oklahoma City at Southwest Baptist Church, I thought I was being punished for something. I didn't even want to leave. Went down there and God began to work in ways I never imagined and never dreamed. I have to say that through 20 years, my wife and I sat together on many a Sunday night and said, Praise God. Can you believe what's going on here? It just got better and better. Amen. We just celebrated 54 years of marriage. Uh, two weeks ago this Thursday, or three, whenever it was, May 28th. <laughs> That's what it was. 54 years. You know what she told me? She told me she'd take 54 more yeah. if we could live that long. You think you're something, don't you? No, I think the grace of God is amazing. That's what I think. It's right. And I've, I've loved her. I mean, she is so precious. But I've never loved her like I love her now. I'm serious. So she doesn't look exactly the same. Slower than a great, well, she is a great grandma. So she's slow along the way at times when I'm in a hurry. My soul. We talked it over on our anniversary when I was taking her to a nice place to eat. We sat there and talking. Are we blessed or what? It's like our relationship and our love for each other just keeps going that way. I'm not saying that because that'll preach good right here. It's, it's the way it is where Jesus is in control. I'm not making this up. That's the way it is. This is just a little story to tell us. You see what happens when Jesus is in control? I got a feeling when the rapture comes on the way up. Now, I don't know. I can't prove this. So if you disagree with it, we can still be friends. But I think when we're going up, we might be saying, Jesus, you saved the best till now. And we get to be with the Lord. And then we have these new bodies and this old body is put off. Uh, corruption has put on incorruption. Come on, friends. Mortal has put on immortality and we're made to be like unto him. A and we go through the judgment seat of Christ and sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I just wonder if we're not going to sit there and say, Jesus, you have saved the best till now. And at the end of the tribulation period, he's going to bring it back to this earth. And we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years on this earth. And for the first time in the history since the fall, the world is going to see how a government ought to be run because Jesus is going to be the governor and we'll probably be saying all through the millennium Lord Jesus you saved the best <laughs> and then the old devil's cast into the bottomless pit and we enter into the eternal kingdom and I don't know maybe through eternity Lord you saved the best till now that's just like him it is. So we might look at our own lives and measure 
his lordship and his authority by this. Are we trusting him with our needs? Or acting independent of him? Are we available? No matter though our roles may change in life, are we still available for whatever he has for us? And are we experiencing the refreshing presence of Jesus that even some of his saints, while their life was being snuffed out as martyrs, were never closer to him, nor praised him in a greater way than they did, like Stephen, when their life was taken for believing in him. That's him, friend. That's him. And that last verse says, and his disciples believed in him. He manifested his glory and his disciples believed. Well, that sounds real simple. Do you believe in him, Brother Sam? More and more. <laughs> he gives me reason. More and more. And I've seen his glory. And he'll still manifest who he is and his glory and his work to those that give the control of their life to him. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life abundantly. Amen. You have one life. I don't care how old you are. Give it to Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray now your blessings upon this invitation time. And in no wise could I walk in this place and say who ought to use the invitation to kneel and pray and respond to you. I'm not, it's not my place. I can't do that. But I pray that if your Holy Ghost has spoken, convicted, compelled, convinced someone that in this or that area or maybe their whole livelihood, they're not listening to your authority. They're not acknowledging your control. I pray they'd come tonight, humble themselves and talk to you about that. Confess it. Present themselves as a willing vessel. Willing to do whatever you say. Just like Mary said this morning. Maybe someone is in this room or listening by live stream or whatever method that doesn't know Jesus. No, they, they don't know that kind of life and they know it because there's no real assurance that their sins are forgiven, that Jesus is their Savior. And maybe there's some that know very well they've never been saved. Oh God, I pray that this very night your Holy Spirit would work in those hearts and bring persuasion and conviction that there is no life apart from Jesus. There is no life. The woman at the well had to drink that water and Jesus said that he was the water. In John chapter 6, they ate of that bread and Jesus said, I am the bread. There's just no existence. There's no real life apart from Jesus. If there's some that have never been saved, I pray they'd deal with that tonight. If here in this room, they would come and just let us take the Bible and show them how they can know for sure that they have eternal life. And if over the air, then may they call the church or better yet, right now, just say, oh Lord, I'm a sinner. My sins are on me. I want them washed away. I want them cleansed. I want to be forgiven. Let's use the Bible word. I want to be saved. I want to know that my sins are forgiven and that God is my father. Jesus is my savior and I'm his child. I pray they'd humble themselves and confess to sin and confess that only Jesus, by his death, burial, and resurrection, 
Only Jesus can deal with our sin. Accomplish your will for Jesus' sake. Amen.